goes on. <laughs> but this meeting is being recorded, <laughs> just so you know. Um, and uh, I'm Lee Kesselman, and I teach music at College of DuPage, and I'm joined on the screen by um, Ken Paoli, uh, who also teaches music, and Matt Shevitz, who teaches music, and Deb Zellman, who's our Applied Music Coordinator. Um, so we all teach different parts of the music curriculum, but we are all heavily involved in the whole thing. This is Music Fridays at noon, of course. We have a regular series of Friday noon programs, even, even virtual this year. So our next event will be September 25th, It'll be a duo recital with Andy Rocha, who's our trombone teacher, and William Burr, who's one of our staff pianists. And you can find that event on September 25th, the same place you found this one, which is at atthemac.org. Click the box that says Music Fridays at noon. Look for the date of the event, click that, and you should be in and ready to go. So we look forward to Andy and Bill performing uh, two weeks from today on September 25th. Today, the music faculty will uh, be talking about, so you want to be a music major. Um, there used to be a sign up in, a, in the Mac, uh, back when we were in the Mac, and it said, amaze your friends, horrify your, your parents, become an actor. Um, and uh, we often use that same uh, expression for the music people, but hopefully today we'll be able to decode that just a little bit. We're going to talk about careers. We're going to talk about baccalaureate degrees, bachelor's degrees. We'll talk about associate degrees and certificates, and we'll talk about the transfer process in music. If we raise any, any issues or questions that you'd like to have answered, please put those questions in the chat room and um, and we will, uh, uh, Deb, Deb will shuttle those questions to us as we take breaks for questions along the way. So um, that's the goal today, that's the process, and that's the, that's the cast of characters. Uh, first up is going to be uh, one of our chief characters, that's Matt Shevitz. Um, Matt uh, is most recently to the music faculty. He teaches the jazz ensembles, he looks over the other instrumental ensembles, and he teaches um, theory, oral skills, survey classes, all kinds of things uh, in the classroom as well. Matt's going to talk a little bit about careers in music and, uh, and then on from there to baccalaureate degrees. Take it away, Matt. Okay, well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for attending. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here to talk about all of the facets of a music major, including, of course, what you can do with uh, one once you graduate, right? That is always the big question that people have. They certainly have the enthusiasm to enroll in the classes, but then the question becomes, okay, what, what do I do once I'm done? Um, I suppose it would be nice for me to have a whole list of careers uh, for you to to think about for you to be aware of and there certainly are a lot of different options but i think what i'd like to to go for first is just to emphasize the fact that um when someone graduates with a music degree when someone graduates with any degree it is important that they have an open mind that they are flexible that they are open to different opportunities that might um, arise and where they might lead, uh, especially those opportunities that might seem uh, less appealing upon graduation, right? Uh, that is a big issue that I think a lot of people have. They, they want to um, basically go from uh, uh, receiving their degree to you know, walking right into being, I don't know, a um, uh, principal of, uh, of, of their, their section, the, the New York Phil or something like that. Um, they, they, want, they want the big job right away. And so the first thing I wanna emphasize is just the fact that people need to be open to working their way up in any industry, but also in music. The arts themselves, I think, really lend themselves towards um, uh, uh, this ease of staying connected with one's field once you graduate. There are certain degrees that once people receive them, uh, if they don't get a job in that area right away, they have a harder time staying connected with what's happening in that field. Music and the arts in general, uh, though, Lends, lends itself very well towards that, that connection. You can have someone who graduates who maybe uh, is, is doing a few different things and 
in order to, you know, just cover their expenses in order to, you know, pay their bills and whatnot. And uh, some of them might be uh, non-music related, but some of them will be music related, such as teaching lessons or playing gigs. Um, and I think that's really important for, for people to keep in mind. I, the arts lend themselves better towards that, that type of, uh, um, well, that, that methodology of, of maintaining your expertise. Um, and so, you know, one of the examples I'd like to use for that is actually my own story, uh, which I will try to keep short. Uh, but when I graduated with my bachelor's, degree i wasn't exactly sure what i was going to do i wanted to play saxophone i wanted to play jazz i wanted to play popular music uh, i didn't really know what else to do uh, and what i what i wound up doing was working for a music festival uh, during that that time though it, it, it wasn't like i i had graduated and i was brought into uh oh, I don't know, be, be the director of education for the festival. I was doing grunt work. Uh, the festival's offices at the time were moving, and I was the one that was doing most of the moving. <laughs> I was moving all of the program boxes, uh, which was very involved, very laborious. I was using my own card to do so. It, it was this, it was not glamorous. I was occasionally stapling programs uh, uh, for, for concerts. But it grew into a position where after a couple of years, I was helping to uh, coordinate the after school program, to coordinate summer camps. I was playing with guest artists uh, like Bucky Pizzarelli and Dick Hyman when they were coming to town. It was, and, and that was all an amazing experience. So again, you have to keep in mind that you have to uh, work your way up in an industry. Um, and be open to to those, you know, to some of these possibilities that might not seem the most glamorous at first, but lead towards what it is that that you would really like to do. And then tied in with that, of course, is the need to be versatile, right? Um, if you are not, I'm sorry, let me rephrase. If you are versatile, if you're able to take on those various opportunities as they come up, uh, then uh, you know, you're you're more likely to to have an easier time just kind of moving up that that ladder and advancing. If you sit um, around and only focus on one thing, uh, if you can focus on it very very well and get recognition for that, that's great. But most of the time, people need to be versatile. I mean, I'm looking, you know, at my colleagues who who are co-hosting this session with me. These are three incredibly versatile musicians right um none of them specialize in just one thing they're very good at several so it's really important to keep that in mind now in terms of actual careers uh most people tend to think of two two careers right when they when they major in music oh i'm going to teach or oh i'm going to perform right but if you think about those two individuals and everyone who's surrounding them, there are actually a lot of different opportunities available. So uh, if you think about someone who's teaching, right, there are the administrators that are involved. There are the, um, you know, if I think about the people that I interact with at, at COD, right, I have the administrators, I have uh, people who are helping to coordinate private lessons, right, invaluable in, in that respect. I have the wonderful uh, people at the at the Mac who help uh, help me put on concerts. Then I have textbook representatives that come by every once in a while when we're on campus um, to to talk about you know the latest offerings that they have. Well, you have the textbook representatives, you have the publishers there, you have the authors of those those textbooks, and that's just a few of the people surrounding someone in my position as an educator. And you think about someone who's performing, which I also do. You have the venue managers, you have the booking agents, right? You have the promoters, you have the critics, you have um, people who are, are recording.
uh, one moment it appears that um, Matt Matt's connection. Like yeah, you can pick up Lee. Okay. Sure. Boarding of universities that have some. There's a couple of universities that have some uh, uh, websites available for this. I'm not sure if I can. I share my screen for a second. Let's see, it looks like I can. Yes. So if you can see, yeah. So this, I believe, is the, um, I think I'm getting this from uh, Berkeley, if I'm, not, if I'm not mistaken. And this is a wonderful resource, it gives you an idea as to the different things that you can do. So yes, education is at the top, but notice it goes beyond teaching, it goes also to research. Yes, private lessons. And a lot of people will think, oh, teaching is K through 12, teaching is colleges and universities, but there's daycare centers, there's running your own studio, you know, there's children's music programs, like what I was doing with, with an after school program for a music festival. Then there's strategies for how you can um, uh, uh, obtain these positions. When you move down and you get performance, yes, instrumental and vocal, but all of the different areas to perform cruise lines, radio, opera companies, community choral groups, small ensembles, you know, it's all, it's all over the place. Um, there's a lot of different opportunities. We move down, we get conducting. Uh, again, lots of different opportunities there and strategies for securing those positions. Composing, arranging, music libraries. If I go down a little bit further, I'd like to actually go down, uh, I, I do, I know we have some people from the MAC who are who are in this session. I want to make sure I point out all of these opportunities for people to work behind the scenes, right? Uh, again, those people are crucial to the success of a of a performance. Um, so, uh, but if if I go down, we get down to um, let's see where is it? Oop, I think I passed it. Human services. There it is. Music therapy. And this is a growing field for music majors. This is one that prior to the pandemic was, was growing at, and, and recognized as something that was vital um, to, to uh, so many different people. But certainly because of the pandemic, um, its importance has only increased as uh, uh, more and more people need um, this kind of interaction, this kind of uh, uh, these kind of therapeutic experiences. So, there are a lot of wonderful opportunities available. What I will say, going back to my initial point, is that you'll get people. Again, I'm looking at my my colleagues here now, who do a few of these things, right? Like Professor Kesselman, you know, um, he's teaching, he's directing choirs, he's uh, a guest clinician, he composes. Right, Professor Paoli uh, is is the same is 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 very similar in that in that respect. Both very well respected composers. Uh, myself, I'm teaching. I'm playing gigs. Yes, I'm I'm uh, playing both as a leader and as a as a side musician, and I'm writing my own music. Um, there's a lot of different things that that you can do with that music major. So it's not you know, and, and it's not just one or two things. It's not just teaching. It's not just performing. There's a, several different opportunities. And the important thing for you to keep in mind is that you need to be versatile and be flexible in, in um, your mode of thinking. That's great, Matt. Um, the, uh, this website, what can I do with this major looks really, really useful for all the, the things they've thought about, not just in jobs and employers, but also strategies. I think that's really great. And, and I hope that people who are interested in majors will, um, will uh, take advantage of this particular website. If they watch this recording, we are recording it and we'll get it up on the Mac YouTube channel. Um, but also uh, if, if you can just jot it down right now, what can I do with this major? Couldn't be a better title than that. Uh, if you don't mind, Matt, I'm gonna go ahead and talk a little bit about baccalaureate degrees and then we'll hand it off to Ken for the associate. Sure, degree. that sounds good. So, you know, what, 
what Professor Shevitz just talked about, which is being flexible and maybe doing more than one thing and thinking about yourself in a sense as your portfolio, which is you develop all the competencies and that you can and all the things you're interested in doing and all the things that might provide a part to that puzzle that makes up a full life and employment and so forth, is that schools, um, um, music schools, uh, places where you get bachelor's degrees in music or master's or doctorates, have divided their populations in music in, in ways that tell you what kinds of degrees you would be likely to get, and then you position yourself after that toward a career. So, um, obviously, one can get a performance degree. You can get a performance degree in violin or piano or voice or, or something else. In some countries, they offer a lot of accordion degrees, not so much in the U.S., but every once in a while, we get someone from the Conservatory of Warsaw who has gotten a, an accordion degree. Um, so performing, learning how to perform, learning how to perform as well as you can is one de degree option. Another would be to get a degree in composition or theory in composition if you're interested in structure or creating music. A lot of schools don't offer composition bachelors. They say you really need to be good at playing something or doing something before you do that. But some schools have a composition degree or a theory and composition degree or theory comp. Um, you can get a music education degree which certifies you to teach in the state of Illinois in a public school. So when someone says, I want to teach piano lessons, they often say, oh, so I need a music ed degree, music education. Well, music education is specifically aimed toward elementary, middle, high school education, either public or, or private, but, but it will certify, you'll get a certification that the state will recognize you as a teacher. Usually private lesson teachers, while they may have a music education degree, they might also just have a performance degree and either one of those will work well. Sometimes you'll get a degree in piano performance and pedagogy, meaning playing and teaching the piano, but that wouldn't entitle you to teach in a classroom. That would entitle you to teach private lessons. Um, music education is usually a, a, a separate path of, of courses. Um, but education, composition, and performance are three of the best known degrees in music. Um, the next one would be music therapy, and, and Mr. Shevitz was just talking about that. Music therapy is using music as a therapeutic tool for patients who need that for, for some other reason. Sometimes it's people who, um, who've been disabled. Uh, sometimes it's people with emotional um, uh, uh, characteristics that make it very difficult for them to, to lead what we would call a normal life. And what that just means is that sometimes music unlocks a lot of keys for people. And that can be people who, are, who uh, live in an institution, or that can be people who live right out here with the rest of us, um, for whom music is really a great therapeutic tool. Stroke victims often find music therapy to be tremendously helpful. Uh, Gabby Gifford, the congresswoman who was shot in the head, was, being, was seeing a music therapist um, those are, those are uh, music therapy has been very successful with students, uh, younger and older people on the autism spectrum. So those are all possibilities for a music therapist. You have to want to help people and you have to want to use your music to help do that. But a lot of people who are music therapists who are in their career, in their day job as music therapists are playing gigs at night or writing music. As Mr. Shevitz said, you have to be prepared to be flexible, but also to think of sort of your, your career, your vocation as a, maybe a broader spectrum of what, what's going on in your life. Uh, and finally, there's that whole realm of, of careers in, uh, and degrees in music business. And so um, when we started to see all those occupations that are required among the MAC staff or at Orchestra Hall or at the United Center, um, some of those people have music degrees. And if they do, they might be in music business or they might be in performance or even composition and theory. Um, but the music business really marries the, the administrative and business aspects to a love of music. So we have a music business degree that uh, Professor Paley will be talking about in a minute. But music business is a marriage between business and music, the same way music therapy is a marriage between being a, th a therapist, occupational or physical therapist, with being a musician. Um, and, and those are the, the primary. We, there is a small group of people who get degrees in music history or musicology, as we call it. Um, those people are usually going to get one or two more degrees later on and, and find their way to a doctorate because it really leads to college teaching or research or maybe editorial work. Ethnomusicology is another degree possibility. 
University of Illinois has a great ethnomusicology or ethno or ethnomusicology as we call it. Um, and that's the study of culture and music. So uh, Dr. Ward, who used to teach with us at College of DuPage, had a doctorate in ethnomusicology from University of Illinois. That's like marrying anthropology to music and that's the child, uh, the love child of anthropology and music, is that, that there are these areas that, that really combine two different areas of study in order to get to that place. Even in the field of psychology, there are people who are psychologists, but their research area becomes one about musical cognition or perception. Um, and I guess what that means is that if a student comes in for advising to any of the four of us on the screen, um, we somewhere along the way usually say, so what, what do you see yourself doing with this? And often an 18 year old will, say, will run from the room in horror that I've asked about what they want to do with their life. But, but if you say, what do you want to do with this? And they say, oh, I want to perform. I, okay, that's a choice. Then we can talk about music performance degrees. Often someone comes in and says, well, I'm not sure, but I really love music. It's my passion. I want to do that. And then we talk a little bit about these career options, about the career options that Mr. Shevitz talked about, about the undergraduate degrees that might prepare you for those career options. Um, and then that gets to College of DuPage and what do we do? So we have two degrees and a certificate and take it away, Ken Paoli. Um, I will preface things by saying that the associate degree is a middling point. Um, and uh, at the College of DuPage offers these degrees. Uh, I was here several years before we finally put an AFA in music together. Um, and I believe theater still does not have an AFA. Uh, and partly that is because we don't, uh, we are sending institutions. And so therefore our curriculum is in part dictated to us. Um, for, for that, those courses that will allow you to matriculate and matriculate easily. So it should be prefaced that we don't necessarily graduate a lot of people with these AFA degrees, but the fact that they have been researched and put together guarantees that if you follow that path, your matriculation will be much easier, uh, even to schools that are not part of the state of Illinois system. So uh, that would be one thing. Uh, uh, an addendum to Matt uh, in the Handbook to the Music Business by Baskerville, chapter 28 is an extensive list uh, with, uh, with uh, elucidations of all the many careers that people can go into. Um, one of the things that is common to both of our uh, degrees, our AFA in music and our AAS in music business, is the two-year theory course. The two-year theory core um, really, again, that's one of those things that's pretty much dictated to us if you want to matriculate. Uh, and uh, some people say, well, do I need that for music business? Well, our research uh, in putting together that degree showed us that almost all of the receiving institutions required two years of music study, which includes theory, ear training, and keyboard skills. And uh, unfortunately, for many people who are now coming to college and wanting to uh, go into something like music business, they don't necessarily have the traditional high school background in either band, choir, or orchestra. So as a result, um, they're making music with a computer. And the theory core can be extremely difficult for people who might not even have basic reading skills. Um, but once again, there's, there's really no way for you to matriculate to an Elmhurst College, to a, a Bradley, uh, to a Milliken, uh, to Circle <laughs> Campus or UIC Chicago. You can't, you can't matriculate to any of these places without that uh, two-year program. And if you transfer there, uh, having only taken one year of theory, you'll be taking the second year of theory at the receiving institution. Uh, one thing that should also be mentioned about all music curricula is that they are front-loaded. Um, it means that when you come into the music school, you start taking music theory from day one, and you are a music major, and uh, you are taking lots of courses. And if you're going to be a music ed degree, and uh, I, have, I have covered two bachelor curricula, so I have a music ed degree, but I also have a composition degree as well. And... Um, 
yes, you will be taking a lot of one hour credit, credit lessons that will, you'll be saying like, why am I doing this? Why am I only getting one hour credit for uh, choral conducting? Well, it's because uh, there's so many needs in an education degree between the music portion and the education portion, which is of course, in part dictated by the state that you take the courses in. One thing about an ed degree, and of course that's the degree that I promote for just about everybody, uh, is the fact that once you get it certified uh, K to 12 instrumental or choral, you should be able to teach at least in the 48 contiguous states only needing to take a constitution exam. Uh, the other thing is, uh, I'm old enough now to look back, uh, and I, uh, I accumulated all of my degrees in a straight line. Uh, I had a lot of, there was a lot of work in Chicago uh, back in the 60s and 70s. And many of my classmates dropped out of college uh, to, to do jobs, to play gigs, basically. There was so much work to be had. And uh, I got chided more than once for staying in school and for spending that time. Um, but later in the 70s, when the technology began to impact the market, uh, guess who was working? <laughs> the guy who stayed in school. I had friends of mine who played trombone who, you know, ended up sending, uh, selling Caterpillar equipment <laughs> and things like that to make their mortgages. So you need to look at your career in a long view and think of it as a marathon, not a sprint. And as a result, getting those degrees is extremely important. They can never be taken away from you. And I like the Ed degree mostly because once you get it, you can just go out and substitute teach. You don't have to take a full-time teaching job. You can go out and still pursue some of the artistic goals that you have and give those things a try, but you can still have income and you can dictate when, when and where and how you want to do uh, that teaching. Um, so our program is pretty much set up uh, in either instance where you will take a certain amount of gen eds and you'll take our core uh, and you'll take private lessons, which are of course two years of private lessons on a major instrument or what you need to transfer. Um, but it should be said that uh, some people um, don't take all of our courses, do not get the AA, but certainly successfully transfer. And we have many, many students who do just that. Now, some of that has to do with weirdness in the degree. So for instance, we have a music lit course, which we think is very important in increasing your understanding of the literature and the literature in its proper time perspective. Well, uh, that's not accepted. <laughs> so a lot of people will say, oh, I don't need to take that. So I'm not going to take that course. And I'm going to transfer to Western, Eastern, Southern, Northern. Okay, but you can't get our AA without that course. And it's the same thing in music business. We have a survey of music business course. Now that's a, in our two-year AAS program. So people, we have a lot of people that transfer to Elmhurst. And that course is not accepted at Elmer's because it's a junior level offering at their institution. So at the same time, I've got people that go to Elmhurst, but they don't have to take my music business course here because it's not accepted. And so of course they're not gonna get the AAS, but they can certainly successfully transfer to Elmhurst, probably get a really big scholarship and pursue their degree. And so that should be kept in mind that uh, these programs are, we're, we're like a, uh, it's a midpoint and that, um, and yeah, and that it, it's not necessarily a, a do or die situation to have the AA degree. Uh, obviously, it's much more important to get that bachelor's degree. And for certain careers, for college teaching, for instance, you have to have a doctorate or you've got to be like so wildly successful that they'll overlook that fact. Uh, and even then, you're going to be competing with tons of people who have PhDs and are pretty successful at that level as well. So, um, yeah, I, you know, and of course, we also have a production certificate. Uh, that's really only a two semester course. And that's kind of like for people that want to dip their toe into the pool and see how the water is. Um, and um, hopefully those people see the need to continue on in the music business area. Um, and uh, move forward towards a degree. And we have several students who have indeed in, uh, have done both the music business and the audio production certificate to cover both uh, things. And I, I should have made a sign, but if you want my best advice for the future, 
learn to code, <laughs> computer code. <laughs> I'm glad you said computer code. I was thinking of somebody falling down in the hospital and needing needing resuscitation. Code code blue. Code blue. Code blue, right. So so just to summarize a little bit, we have an AFA degree, which points you toward most bachelor's degrees in music, uh, including music education and music performance and music composition and all those. The same the first two years are the same. When when Professor Paley says they're front loaded, it's because we start everybody off in boot camp and that's freshman sophomore year and that doesn't it doesn't matter whether you're a good musician and whether you were the star of your high school band or or what or any of those things everybody needs literacy and that's what we're talking about is those basic courses we have the aas the associate of applied science in music business and that is specifically for people who think they're going to be in that combination, that hybrid field that involves music and business. And we do have a two plus two degree program with Elmhurst College. We've, as, as uh, Professor Paley said, we, we do uh, transfer people there pretty easily because of our, our relationship with them. And that certificate, the recording certificate, is really interesting because um, sometimes it's somebody who says, well, I, I don't really wanna be in school very long, I can't afford that, or I'm, I don't have much time, or I, I don't know what the reason is. And so they start doing that and then they go, wow, well, this is good stuff, I think I'm gonna move into the music business and they add that and they find themselves going on. We get some people in the recording certificate, which is not really a transfer degree, it's a, it's a vocational degree, a vocational certificate. And some of those people, some their band got together and elected them to go learn how to record the band better. I mean, that happens where, where somebody really doesn't want the end result of the certificate, but they do want some of the skills. The other interesting thing about recording, and I think a lot of the music business areas, but P Professor Shevitz talked about this, even in terms of performance and teaching, and that is some of what music education used to be was very much um, an apprenticeship model, is that if you were a com composition student of Mozart, you, <laughs> he didn't give you composition lessons, he had you copy out his music until you got pretty good at it. And if you wanna, wanna be a recording engineer, you're gonna find your way working maybe for free in a recording studio or doing something like that, learning how to do something well enough that somebody when someone else calls in sick, they say, can you handle the board today? And, and that's an apprenticeship model. That's not the traditional educational model. But if you get the educational certificate or the degree, then you're prepared to go out there and hoof it a little bit and ask somebody for some ex real life experiences. It's like playing in a jazz band. Nobody walks out of a bachelor's degree and somehow gets hired as a gig player. You get hired as a gig player when someone else hears you play because you, you can't help yourself, you have to perform and you start doing that and then eventually someone needs a sub and then someone says, well, that went pretty well, let's hire them a second time and then maybe we really like the way this person plays and, and that, we do a lot of things with apprenticeship in music and it makes sense. We, we're talking about artistry, we're talking about skill development and we're talking about knowledge and those things don't all come equally through degree programs. Um, I, I'm sure I'd like, to add, I'd like to add one last thing here mm -hmm. <laughs> since you're on the production certificate. A lot of times that uh, that draws in people who are looking for a shortcut. Uh, once when I was a young young lad, my father said, everybody wants to go to heaven and nobody mm -hmm. wants to die to get there. And uh, I hear a term, uh, the term producer. I am a producer. Um, in my day, uh, I was and I am a producer, by the way, and I, but I have produced things. And I was a jingle producer, and I wrote and scored and uh, recorded commercials um, uh, for the most part, some films. But, for the, but basically, I did produce something. But today, that term means somebody who either makes or buys a beat and then looks to sell it or looks to get somebody to rap over that beat and find somebody. And of course, those kinds of people, um, you, if, at, in terms of a career, uh, you just as well might as you just go to the 7 Eleven and buy a lottery ticket <laughs> because that's really where it's at. Um, and so, uh, again, everybody wants to go to heaven, nobody wants to die to get there. Everybody wants the glory, but nobody wants to put in the work. And even if you want to become a successful recording and music producer, you must put in the work. There are no shortcuts. 
and a 1500 word article on EQ from Guitar Player Magazine is not going to substitute for the actual effort and, and the experience you gain from actually running a console and EQing instruments and actually working with the material. All right, end of sermon. If, if I could add a, a, a couple of things. Um, uh, yeah, I, I think by going 7-Eleven and getting a lottery, did, um, you know, there's a chance, right? And <laughs> everyone wants, wants to, to give that a shot. But that just that goes back to what I was speaking about initially about just being being versatile. You know, if if you want to just be a producer of just one kind of music, then yeah, go buy that lottery ticket. But if you want to add that to your package of income and and how you're going to um, to cover your expenses and just move forward in 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 your career, well then right there's there's some some value there. It's Honestly, it's the same as if someone only wants to play, you know, like acoustic post bop style jazz, right? Um, if they're only going to do that, and there are those people out there, they're only going to do that. It's it's going to be a little more challenging for them, right? But the, if if they're able to be versatile, uh, as so many great jazz musicians are. Uh, you know, you look at Herbie Hancock, you look at um, Chris Potter, you look at Chick Corea, you look at everybody, right? Uh, you, most of the people that, that are out there on the scene, at some point in their careers, if not still currently, they're playing a few different styles of music, right? They get hired and they go, you know, at least as a session player to play for someone. Um, Right, they have uh, a more varied career that they're and they're able to take on those opportunities because they've worked on their versatility, uh, and and they're just they're more successful. They have an easier chance at success. Uh, also, going back to what um, Dr. Pioli was was referring to earlier in terms of an education and um, you know certain opportunities that that can. Uh, come up that can distract you from from your. Uh oh. It looks like we've lost Professor Shevitz. Education, but the importance of still sticking with it. And did I freeze? You're okay now. You're good. I'm okay now. Okay. Sorry. Um, you were talking about opportunities. <laughs> yes, opportunity in 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 terms of. Uh, performing and then and, and uh, certain things that can come up while you're in school it can be very tempting to leave some things kind of behind like your studies and just go and pursue those but um, there you know there is a little bit of, of a risk when you do that and that is the nice thing about getting a, a degree is that it can give you um, a little more assurance of a, of a longer lasting career and my example, I know this will um, date me a little bit for some make me seem old and others make me seem too, too young. But um, uh, during the, the, what was it? The retro swing craze in the nineties, there was a group called the chair. Oh. I'm dying to know what that group was. Kind of like the Stray Cats guy, uh, who did his. Who's got a big band? You know I mean? Probably, yeah. Oh, okay. Um, we seem to have lost Professor Shevitz again. Um, but um, I'm gonna gonna sort of very pop and daddies that They're came out of a very. I don't know if my is my internet still okay. Okay, cool. Yeah. Can you back a Very big hit uh, called Zoot Suit Ryan. Sure. You said Cherry sure. so, and Daddies. Is uh, that right? Cherry Pop and Daddies had a cherry big pop. hit called Zoot. Zoot Suit Riot. Uh, they toured the world. I had a chance to join that band right before that hit happened uh, and chose to stay in school instead. Uh, would it have been nice to, you know, go play gigs in Australia and all over the place? Sure. But when that popularity faded, who, who was calling me at the music festival, <laughs> right? Saying, hey, are you, are you guys hiring? Do you need anything? <laughs> 
Um, it was, you know, like the, the trumpet player from the horn section. So um, it's, it, it's an interesting experience. Um, I think we had a couple of questions. Yeah, um, so just before we do that, I wanna say that, that uh, if you have questions we don't answer during this hour, please feel, to con feel free to contact any of the four of us. We're all in this College of DuPage uh, email system. You can find us online. Um, and um, we, we do have private lessons in every instrument and in voice. And um, we have these degrees and certificates we're talking about, and we have lots of ensembles. And while we're a little bit under, uh, under-programmed right now because of COVID-19. We actually have five ensembles rehearsing on campus right now, and our music theory core courses are on campus, and all of our private instructors are teaching online, and we've got a variety of different ways of approaching that. I see names up here, some of our, our terrific um, applied instructors, and I realize that all of them do a bunch of things. Um, and, and not only are they extraordinary teachers, uh, but Ann Williams and uh, Elizabeth Murphy voice and Carolyn May flute and David Rice jazz piano and Dave Govertson was on here a moment ago uh, doing voice. Um, all these people have pieced together lives that involve exactly what we're talking about. Um, some may be Carolyn May with um, public school teaching for years, but a tremendous performance career. And, and all, all five people I mentioned really hang their hat in on a number of different hooks. Um, and that is so much more frequently the case than not. Uh, it, it really is worth calling our attention to. So uh, Deb Zellman, do you have any questions for us that have come up in the chat room? Yes, we have a question from Jasmine. How many credits are needed for an associate degree in performance and pedagogy? Also, could you talk about the vocal course? Is it like a singing class? Okay, I guess I'll, I'll take that one. The, the associates, the AFA, which is the one that heads you toward the performance and pedagogy degree at a four-year school. Remember, Professor Paley said, we're the halfway point. We, we at the associates level, are uh, putting together two-year degrees for students so that they can go on and complete that at a four-year school. So our degree is, I believe, uh, 64 credit hours. Is that right, Professor Paley? Yes, both of ours, both of the degrees. 64, and that's four semesters of 16 each, that total 64. And if you go to uh, www.cod.edu and then click on academics and then click on programs and then click on music, you will find those degrees uh, and certificate all listed with all their course requirements and so forth. Um, we can, if you want to talk to any of the four of us uh, in a separate email chat, we can help you with that as well. The vocal thing, the vocal side is, one would normally be getting either a degree in vocal, in, mu in music education with a vocal emphasis or in voice performance. And in, the thing is that AFA doesn't change much depending on where you're going and what you're doing. The AFA is very similar, it's a foundational degree. So if you're an instrumentalist or you're a vocalist, you might be in different ensembles and be taking lessons on different instruments, but the coursework is essentially the same. When you get to the four-year school, it changes more. On the voice side, one would want to be in, if, if you were a voice major or music education voice emphasis, you would want to be taking voice lessons. You'd be talking to Mrs. Zellman about setting those up with one of our fine teachers. Um, and you, for your ensemble credits, you'd be in a choir because that would make the most sense. Those are, that's what people at the four-year school are looking for. If you say, I want to be a uh, we have a, have a wonderful school student who just went to Bradley University this fall and is doing very well. Um, uh, and Mackenzie uh, plays flute and string bass and electric bass. And she played in student jazz groups and she played in the concert band and she played in the big band, I believe. And she sang in choir. She did all those things. She just kept adding ensembles because she- And figured, orchestra. And orchestra, <laughs> string bass, right. So she was in, in at one time or another in her couple of years with us in about five different ensembles. She's going to be a big hit when she goes and auditions and, and applies for a music education job because they're going to see in her someone who meets all those characteristics Mr. Chavez was talking about. Someone who's really good at, at her stuff and who's also really broadly based and can do a number of things. So she took a number of ensembles, vocal and instrumental, and most of her lessons were on the flute, which is her major instrument, although I think she may have studied bass as well. Um, so so that is, that's where the difference in the AFA is, is which private lessons you take, we call them applied music, 
and which ensembles you play or sing in, although it is true many of our people do more than one ensemble, uh, and particularly if they're instrumentalists and they want to be better at singing, or they're singers and they want to be better at instruments, uh, so a lot of those will take percussion ensemble and, and really learn how to do that as well. When you certify to teach, um, they want to know whether you can conduct band or choir or teach general music or play or conduct orchestra. Someone like Mackenzie will be able to do all of those things. And so she could find a small school that's looking to hire one music person and they, they will strike it rich and so will she. Any other questions, Deb, that have come up so far? Um, not uh, if anyone wants to drop questions into the chat, please feel free. Um, okay. I can say for a moment, my, my background is a little bit different from our panelists in that I was a public school teacher for seven years um, when I first got out of college. My undergrad is in music ed and my emphasis was instrumental clarinet. Uh, but my first job ended up being general music and choral and I'd had courses in that. Um, when you have a music education degree, you earn a teaching certificate, as, as Mr. Kesselman was explaining, and uh, mine was a K-12 certificate, and I'd had um, a lot of experience singing in church, and for me, that was an example of versatility. So when I went out into teaching, I found that that was a good fit, and I taught um, K-6 and then middle school, um, but currently I teach um, clarinet at the community college uh, level. And um, for that, um, to their point about staying in school, I continued in not a master's degree in clarinet performance. And when I initially got up and I was teaching general music, I thought, well, you know, that doesn't seem all that useful. It bumped me up a little bit on the pay scale. But when the opportunity came up uh, further years down the road to work at a community college, I was able to apply and be considered because I had a master's degree. They did require that um, of all of, of the teachers. So um, we, we will either continue with um, our next topic, but if you have questions, please drop them in the chat bar. So we're gonna talk a little bit about the transfer process. And again, this is different from a lot of other fields in that if you're going to transfer to a music school, they want to know what you can do in music. Of course, they wanna look at your transcript as well and they want a grade point that is respectable, um, but they, they really do want to hear you play or hear you sing. And that's a huge part of the music transfer process. We tell students to look at at least three schools when they're thinking about transferring. And we have a good record with students going to many of Illinois uh, music schools and some, some of them out of state. But that means scheduling an audition. That means contacting the transfer institution and finding out when their auditions are and what their requirements are. Our, your applied teacher can help you prepare for that audition by getting the right music ready and being prepared to play scales or arpeggios or whatever else they might ask for. Um, that's what our people are truly expert at is, is knowing what happens next. Um, so let's say you wanted to, our, probably our three most popular transfer institutions would be North Central, Elmhurst, and ISU. But we've had students at, I think, just about every school that teaches music in the state of Illinois at one time or another. Um, and so I would say if you're interested in going to one of those schools that in your freshman year with us, you start looking around their website and poking around and maybe you take a day when we don't have classes and you go visit them. COVID has made this more difficult. But you, you sit in on an ensemble, you see what that looks like. You imagine, could I be on this campus? Would this feel right to me? Would this be home? Uh, could this be home for a few years? You find out from them what their audition process is, what their application process is. If you go to Northern Illinois University, you apply to the university, but you also apply to the Department of Music for entrance to the Department of Music. And that's not true in every field, but it is true in music. So someone will say, oh, I got into NIU. I'll say, great, did you get in as a music major? Uh, no, they said I had to wait and do something or, you know, or I hadn't had the right courses at COD or, or my audition is coming up. So I don't know if I got in yet or not. So there's the audition. And then there is also scholarship money, because if you can do something useful, like play the clarinet or, or play the accordion or sing or play the saxophone, is that you, you might be eligible for scholarship money. And that audition generally is an entrance and a scholarship audition. 
our goal is that if that's where you want to go, that we help you prepare well enough to get some money for going there. And there are music scholarships at every school I can think of. Some of them are small, some of them are bigger. If you're a music major and you play really well, you're eligible for a bigger one. So I, we had a colleague at COD for a while who was one of our staff pianists, and her son was a biology major at Michigan State University, but he had played in the high school marching band on trombone. And he applied to Michigan State and she came in one day and she was laughing and she said, well, Carl's going to Michigan State. I said, oh, that's great, Barbara, that's terrific. And he got a music scholarship. I said, I thought he was going into something else. She said, he was, he is, he's going into biology, but they're paying him $1,000 a year to play in the marching band. There you go, is that he played in the marching band for four years. He got to go to the Rose Bowl parade and all the rest of that stuff. Why? Because they needed to have another trombone in the marching band and a good one. So. I think in the transfer process, the most important thing is to talk to a music faculty person at COD, someone you have in classes, uh, or Mrs. Zellman, any of us, and say, and talk a little about what schools you might be looking at, or maybe talk about what you're looking for, and we can help point you to look at some schools. And then get involved on their website and contact their music program. Don't contact their general admissions office. And really, I can say the same thing for College of DuPage. We've got great admissions people and counseling staff and so forth. If you're interested in majoring in music, you should be talking to the music faculty. Um, we're, we're the ones who have more specific information about our programs. And so if you're a high schooler watching this, I know we have some who will be. Um, if you wanna to come to COD, talk to one of us about how to get started and what to do. We'll probably hear you play too. Just see where you are, find out what you did in high school and go from there. So that's a little bit about the transfer process. It's very oriented toward contacting the music department rather than just the university or school that you want to go to. And I can say, when I say those three schools get most of our transfers, it's because they have, our students have done really well at those schools. They've gotten credit for what they took. They've gotten scholarship money. I can't remember a student in recent memory who went to Elmhurst or North Central or ISU in music who didn't get some, some money for coming. Um, and we like that news. Uh, as I said, Mackenzie is at um, Bradley and she got a nice deal there as well. Um, we've sent students to Northeastern Illinois and UIC and University of Illinois and, um, and Eastern and Western and, and maybe no one to Southern, but, but um, a lot of schools in the state. And generally, um, generally, we're hopeful that our students can get in, can get accepted as music majors and can receive some scholarship money. You should also, uh, there's a caveat that the audition process oftentimes doesn't end with just getting in, but that if you're a performance major, many schools upon uh, your moving into the junior year will require you to audition to become a performance major. And if you are not up to the level of performance, uh, that decision is pretty much taken out of your hands and they will say, you cannot be a performance major at this institution. Um, and that's why some people then have to adjust their their goals and see how you know how what they're going to apply themselves uh, to in order to get that bachelor's degree. And at more and more schools, even to get accepted into a music education degree, one needs to be able to get into the performance studios. So what Professor Paoli just said is also true for a lot of people getting music education degrees. It used to be, oh, you're not really a very good player. We'll let you be a teacher. Um, the standard has changed. And now, um, if you can't find a spot in that clarinet studio, if you're not good enough for that, they don't want you as a music education major either. And, and that's something to think about. Those private lessons are so, so important. And that's why having a good private lesson teacher is so important and why, why our degrees include studying with someone who's on our faculty, because we know how good they are. I see a question from Ashley about um, yes. um, languages and that is for vocal music, music education or performance, um, very often schools will ask for languages. Um, they want at least some study of languages and we need to usually check with them and see how much study they want of those. And they're usually talking about the major music languages, which would be Italian, French, and German. Sadly, that has not included Spanish yet because I know a lot of our students have been studying Spanish. And it doesn't include really any other languages that we might think of as, as wonderful languages, but um, they're not really the history of music languages where French, Italian, and German are. 
usually doesn't matter much to the school which two of the, if they ask for two or they ask for one, usually doesn't matter much to them which of those would be most important. Uh, they don't, don't usually have, have um, a priority. I would say for singers, Italian is so wonderful. Um, <laughs> yes, vowels everywhere. <laughs> vowels, great vowels, great singing, great art songs, wonderful opera. It's just hard to lose with Italian. I'm a personal fan of French. I wish I had had more French training, but, um, and I think if you were a jazz musician doing research, maybe French would be really helpful because they love so much, so many American jazzers have gone over to, to Paris. Um, German, I, again, these are great languages with great histories of sung music as well as, as musicological resor resources. French and Italian are more similar because they're both romance languages. But I think if a school says, please take two of these, what you want to find out is how much. Do they want a year of each? Do they want two years of each? Do they want at least two years of something and then some other one as well? But I think, I think it varies from school to school a little bit. Uh, maybe maybe uh, uh, Ann Williams or, or Elizabeth Murphy would like to answer, add a little bit on the language side. They're both applied uh, voice teachers at the college and they're both online and they're both currently muted. <laughs> and Beth Murphy steps up to the plate. Oh, <laughs> hello everyone. Um, I'm sort of glad that you didn't put the uh, camera on because I wasn't prepared to be live and in concert. But I, Lee, I, I can. Can, do you want me to? <laughs> no, 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 no. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, Lee, I totally agree with all of the, the information about the voice and, and encouraging those who are considering um, uh, any kind of music education to throw in some vocals. I can't even tell you how many times I've had teachers who are already in school districts being asked, you know, you're, you're, you're running the band, you're running the orchestra, and then they say, okay, we've got budget cuts, we need you to take on the choir too. And they'll come in to take private voice lessons because they're like, I have no idea how to teach children how to sing. I don't know how to sing. So, um, and this, you know, this just goes along with everything that Ken and Matt said too, is that the more uh, versatility that you can have, the more things that you can absorb when you're in school and the more skills that you can, you know, play with. This, I always tell my students, play in the sandbox, play with all the toys in the sandbox. That's what is going to make you shine in those job interviews. That's, and you know, the other thing is, is you never know what inspiration that is going to do and what path that will take you on. It could be a genre of music you've never thought about before. And you take this class and you're being assigned, you know, I've got to study French art song and I'm really a flautist. Well, all of a sudden it opens you up to all kinds of new music that you didn't know existed. And who knows what path that will take you on. Um, as far as the answer, of course, you know, I'm going on and on. A Ashley's question about languages um, if you are drawn to a certain language, go for it. If it feels easy and flowing and something that you can get excited about, languages are, are, are hard in the sense that we live in a country that we don't get to be exposed to a whole lot of languages. So you need to put a lot of time into it on your own. They are, they are typically very, uh, very demanding in your uh, class schedule as well as the, the, the homework schedule that you have to put into it. So if there's a language that you particularly find enjoyable or, or a culture that you're really drawn to, I say go for that. Um, if there isn't anything, I say dabble. Go on um, uh, uh, Apple Music or uh, Spotify and say, okay, give me French art song. And then, okay, give me German art song and hang out and listen to different genres of music and languages of music and see if anything jumps out at you um, to help you make that decision. Sort of live in it a little bit um, and hear it. Uh, so I think that's all I have to say. That's great. Thank you so much. Um, I see that the that our hour has uh, is is nearing an end or is at an end. And <clears throat> as someone who spends a lot of time on Zoom, I'll say that my my capability of lasting longer than an hour on a screen is is pretty limited. Um, I will say this is that September 25th is our next Music Fridays at noon. Andy Rochat trombone and William Burr piano. Uh, that Andy plays that instrument like 
uh, like it's just an instrument of gold. So uh, he's great, and Mr. and uh, and Bill Burr is is magic at the keyboard. So I think between the two of them, you've got an entertaining session coming up. Um, Paoli, Shevitz, Kesselman, Zellman, find any of us on the COD website. Um, do a little poking around if you're interested in that. If you need some advising or want have specific questions you'd like to ask, if you have us for classes, that's great. If not, just take a leap and drop a line to us and we'll respond. Uh, Mrs. Zellman will route you to the, the, the best and the finest, the private teachers in all instruments and in voice. Um, we can start people partway through the semester. We've got a, a mechanism for doing that. It doesn't always mean you can get the full credit, but, but at least getting started is a good idea and it just pushes you further ahead. So we've got some relationship with continuing education for, for non-credit lessons once we're too far into the semester. We offer survey classes in American music, world music, and music appreciation. Those aren't for majors, but they're fun classes and they're great to take. And we've got a terrific faculty, a, a, an incredible faculty of people who teach those things. Um, I, I'll just say this, that as a musician, there are a lot of things that I do. There are a lot of things I really don't do. Um, but I'll say that there's, I can't really say I'm sorry for anything that where I've stretched myself or extended myself, playing in a jazz band or learning how to do some African drumming or um, any of those things, wherever it is, every time accompanying a trombonist, which I did as an undergraduate, every one of those things leads to, as Beth Murphy just said, maybe it will open your ears or your mind to something new. And as, as all three of us have said, career-wise, you are your own portfolio and everything you throw in there just might be useful someday. And who, who knew when Matt Shevitz was an undergraduate that he was gonna be teaching world music? And, and who knew when, when Lee Kesselman was an undergraduate in music that he might find himself doing African drumming and dancing? And, and who knew that Ken Paoli was going to be the ultimate Renaissance man and be able to do everything in technology that wasn't even invented yet at that point in time? And we know that Mrs. Elman, as, a, as an elementary and, and, and K-12 music teacher, didn't know that she was going to be playing in the DuPage Symphony and going to be playing in the Wheaton Band and playing in jazz groups and, and gigs outside and when it's too cold to play outside and teaching clarinet and administering a program of private teaching all as part of the whole thing. So that's who we are. That's what we do. If you have questions, we hope that you'll come find us and ask those questions. We'd love to serve. And um, uh, we're glad to advise high schoolers who are still in that process of making decisions or our own college students or people who have gone on to other careers and are thinking of coming back and taking a few classes and stuff. Mm -hmm. So thanks, Matt. Thanks, Ken. Thanks, Deb. And uh, we'll see you on Music of Fridays about every other Friday this fall semester. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thanks.